Diet and exercise, drugs and medical care. These are what we usually associate with health. But what we don't think about are structures, not just physical structures, but economic, political, and social structures. They may be hard to see, yet they can be powerful determinants of our health. doing a series of photos for a book. I never get tired of taking pictures of the desert. Terrell Du Johnson is a member of the Tohono Otham American Indian tribe. Terrell is an artist and an activist on the reservation south of Phoenix, Arizona. I was Hopi. What'd you guys do? For the last 40 years, the tribe has suffered the highest rate of type 2 diabetes in the world. Half of Tohono Otham adults have type 2 diabetes. How could she move? She died. More wow. than seven times the national average. Rates for children are climbing rapidly. Are you staying with Grandma? Huh? Are you go, I go with them, you can go to the party. You can go swim. We'll see you later. Bye, Bye you guys. For hundreds of years, the Otham lived self-sufficiently on tepary beans, choya buds, local game, crops irrigated by rain and groundwater. Their way of life kept them healthy. Today, that has changed. Danny, I was just asking people when I was taking pictures of them, how diabetes affects them, if it does affect them, what their thoughts were about that. I think some people, they get kind of uh, depressed. Somebody has stated, well, my mom, my sister has diabetes, so I'll probably get it anyway. So that kind of, that attitude that you're, you know, you're eventually going to get it, you know. A lot of people in my family and around me had diabetes, and some, somehow I always thought, well, okay, that's just part of growing up. But they never said they had diabetes. They've always said, I just have bad sugar. I've actually had family members die on the operating table during the process of an amputation. He lost his leg. You know. Oh, he did? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. Oh, no. He was at the elders' conference and was in a wheelchair. A lot of people still don't know. Further north is the Gila River Reservation, home to the Pima. We're the same Otham tribe, it's just that they're desert people, which is Tono. And we're Akimar Otham, which we live by the river. See where those little mountains are at? The river yeah. is just on the south, probably at the base of that mountain there. Mm -hmm. and Henrietta Lopez works there. with the Pima Maricopa yeah. Irrigation Project. At that point there, they divert it out of the river and into a canal like this, okay? This is what we call the Pima Canal, you know, connecting to the river. Her Pima ancestors were master water engineers. Over the centuries, they transformed the desert into farmland in the Gila River Basin. Living along the river meant our life 
it was a part of us. Having the river flowing through our community meant having natural vegetation growing along the river, the willow, the mesquite, the cottonwood trees. I don't believe that really the non-Indian world understands how we're tied to the water, but the water is our life. Those were healthier times for the Pima. But within two short generations, they, like the Tohono Otham, began dying from type 2 diabetes. Most of our uh, records are, uh, are computerized. For years, the medical community believed Pima's susceptibility to diabetes was an anomaly, that something in their biology was unique. These are uh, files that uh, have been uh, collected from our uh, longitudinal study. The National Institutes of Health collected hundreds of thousands of Pima blood samples, tissue biopsies, and medical histories. Our collection of EKGs, these are... Dr. Peter Bennett has devoted most of his professional life to studying diabetes among the Pima. Running the lipid panels on the... After 40 years, $200 million worth of research has increased our understanding of the biochemistry of diabetes but neither the cause nor a cure has been discovered, and rates among the Pima continue to rise. Like many researchers, Bennett now turns his attention to genes for answers. The genetics of, of diabetes has turned out to be really uh, quite complicated. It appears that there are not just one or even two genes involved in the, in the predisposition. And in fact, today we still don't know what combinations of gene abnormalities really lead to uh, very high risks of the disease. But research has shown that whatever genes might increase the risk of diabetes are in fact found the world over, not just among the Pima. And whether they have the genes or not, some populations do have a higher incidence of disease. So really very dramatic figures. These are not our own data, but from a, a paper a couple of years ago. Pacific Islanders, African Americans, Aboriginal peoples in Australia, all suffer from type 2 diabetes at rates double or triple the national averages. They have totally different histories. They're all different populations, and yet they all have the same manifestation. What's going on? What's the common denominator? And in every case, we're talking about people who have been dispossessed of their land and of their history. And they haven't been able to recreate it. In all these far-flung parts of the world, this social circumstance of being ripped from roots ends up with the same manifestation of disease. But this used to be where my sister and I and all the kids slipped, slapped in, and the room next door was, it was a two-bedroom place, you know. For the Tohono Otham and many others across the globe, land, culture, and work vanished in the last century. No indoor plumbing. We used to take our showers, cook, and um, clean. And this was the only source of water. Today, half the Pima and the Tohono Otham live below the poverty line. This condition is the real risk factor for diabetes for Dr. Donald Warren. Well, I went into a modern medical training kind of naively, thinking that I was going to make an impact on Indian health as a primary care physician. Warren has treated Native American tribes in Arizona for years. He's also a health policy consultant from a family of Lakota traditional healers. And in truth, you can have an impact on an individual's lives and their health care, and that's very significant and meaningful. But the health problems occur long before people get to the clinic or to the hospital. When Dr. Warren's patients have type 2 diabetes, their bodies make the insulin needed to convert glucose or blood sugar into energy. But the insulin isn't used efficiently. Glucose then builds up in their bloodstream and can choke off small blood vessels leading to blindness, kidney failure, amputation. Diets high in sugar, fat, and carbohydrates can
can elevate glucose levels, but something else increases those levels as well. There is a direct biochemical connection between living in poverty and the stress that people are under and blood sugar control. When we look at measures of stress, we look at different types of hormones like cortisol or epinephrine, which is adrenaline. All of those chemicals increase blood sugar. And when stress hormones remain high, they continue to trigger the production of glucose. Glucose builds up in the bloodstream, leading to diabetes. Diabetes in America has reached epidemic proportions. We spend over $132 billion a year to treat it. Obesity is a risk factor, and a third of us are obese. But the other critical risk factor is low income. Americans in the lowest income brackets are at least twice as likely as those in the highest to become diabetic. Dr. Warren might like to prescribe affluence, but instead he prescribes a change of diet, more exercise, and if this fails, medication and insulin injections. It's a picture of my sister. She has to take two shots, the syringes. She has to fill them up to the max, and she takes them on both sides of her, her belly. And the doctor said that her um, kidneys would go. But she told me that uh, with a smile, I'm all right for now, she said, which really bummed me out. I was sad. I'm a diabetic. I found out in 96. And so they gave me some pills, and boom. You know, I was stamped and approved and put on that list of diabetics in the Native community. The genocide of Native American peoples may be a familiar story, but its unfolding varied from tribe to tribe and place to place. To understand its continuing impact on the health of the Pima today, we need not look far beyond one series of events. There's a direct connection between the diversion of water in the upper Gila River and the health status and economic status of Pimas and Miracopas. In the 1890s, water simply stopped coming down the Gila River. Upstream, water from the Gila was diverted by dams and water projects, giving white settlers, farmers, ranchers, and mining interests the water they needed. And we were dependent upon that water to grow crops, to provide for ourselves. Not even the 1908 Supreme Court decision upholding water rights for all Native Americans could protect the Pima. The Coolidge Dam. In 1930, one of the largest in the world. Its promise, to provide water for everyone this time including the Pima. Former President Calvin Coolidge celebrated its opening with politicians and businessmen. They dined on china, crystal, and linen. The Pima ate bagged lunches on makeshift tables. Coolidge passed the peace pipe but in the end, the Pima got little of the water, again. We were practically without water for almost an entire century. We were among the poorest people in the United States of America, as are Indians who live in other reservations and still are in that situation. Unable to grow crops, unable to get out and, and work in the fields, unable to develop economically because of the lack of water for almost 100 years was just that's an absolute shame as far as this country is concerned, as far as the state of Arizona is concerned. What is a metaphor for the rest of the country to try to think about in terms of damming the rivers? It would be like saying to this entire country, okay, survive now without money. And how would you do that? How would you change your entire economy? How would you change your entire culture? How would you change your entire lifestyle? And would you be successful? Would people die? And the Pima did die, but they died from starvation, not from diabetes. 
A survey conducted in 1902 found only one case of diabetes among the Pima. But within 30 years of building the Coolidge Dam, there were more than 500. If we had not dammed the rivers back in the 1920s and 1930s, we wouldn't be able to have this lifestyle that we enjoy in Arizona with swimming pools and golf courses and artificial lakes. And with this lifestyle, we're really living outside the laws of nature. And what people, I think, generally speaking, don't realize is that all of the prosperity of Phoenix and the prosperity of this entire state was built on the backs of the health of the local tribes. Pimas lived a very, very difficult life at the bottom of the economic scale. We had almost no recourse except to become dependent upon governmental benefits. Shortly after the dams were built, the U.S. military began distributing free commodity foods to Native Americans. And it definitely brought us through the hard times. This is a commodities building where they host the commodity food. This is where people used to come get their, their cheese, their beans, and their grape juice and stuff. They used to be just rows and rows and rows and rows of those. But this surplus food, white flour, cheese, refined sugar, lard, canned foods, is a diabetic's nightmare, as it was for Terrell's neighbor. They asked her how many people are in your household, and she said about five, and the guy said, well, you can get five boxes of food. And there was chips and candy and canned food, and I thought, well, that's an idea. There's a nice idea about having food, but it's just the wrong kind of food. And I asked her, I said, so what kind of, like, were there any kind of normal food? She goes, well, there were cans of gravy. It was not until 1996 that fresh produce was offered in the program, and authentic traditional foods are still not included. When we think of traditional American Indian food, for example, fry bread is one of the things that comes to mind. Well, in truth, tribes did not have fried bread historically. The roots of fry bread are in the commodity food program. And fry bread is essentially trying to do the best that you can with your commodities, flour, lard, and uh, vegetable shortening. Over generations, when people grow up with that, it becomes a part yeah. of the culture. It, it becomes acculturated into the community that that is part of the norm. There is only one small market on the 581 square mile Gila River Reservation with a small produce section. A regular supermarket is an hour's round trip drive. If you're in an impoverished community and you don't have healthy choices for food and you don't have safe places to exercise, you're tremendously disempowered when it comes to a disease like diabetes. And that has nothing to do with how much medication is in the pharmacy. It has everything to do with social determinants of health, which include that sense of control, that sense of self-empowerment that is important to all of us, whether we're Native or non-Native. It has an impact on self-identity, and it has an impact on one's sense of hope for the future. Some of our people have just given up. Our people lost their identity when we lost our water. Within our community, we have elders that have gone. I always have that in the back of my mind, that those people will never see the water. When I leave the reservation and I see those same people that live out there and use that water, how, how they've benefited from, from our loss. They've benefited so much for so many years. Decisions to benefit some are made every day. They create winners and losers in wealth and in health. In upscale cities like Scottsdale, Arizona, the diabetes rate is only around 5%. In less affluent towns like Bullhead City, the rate is closer to 11%. And on some poor Native American reservations, it continues to be 50%. This is a disease pattern repeated across the country, across the world, and not just for diabetes. Whether you are poor or wealthy or in between is a powerful predictor of how healthy your life will be. So Margaret, how long have you been a diabetic? 
oh gosh, about 30, 36 years or something like that. Maybe even close to 40. I'm losing my my eyesight in that my left eye is r worse than my right eye. Really? I'm diabetes. Margaret Acosta is a respected and Tohono Otham elder and craftsperson. I have, well, She's one of Terrell's teachers. In the past three weeks, I've been a little bit more serious, taking my sugar count as often as I should. It's really, really hard. Managing diabetes is demanding, taking blood I sugar counts four times a day, monitoring diet, staying productive and engaged. So Margaret, do you think diabetes will, will get you at the end? Mm-hmm. I know. I know, so. How does that make you feel? Well, I keep telling everybody I'm going to live till I'm 100, and I am going to live till I'm 100. I tell that to diabetes every day. <laughs> You're not going to get me yet. <laughs> Studies confirm that hopefulness helps to manage diabetes. But for the Otham, hopefulness has been in short supply, up to now. I think I got my shot. <laughs> we have 100 years of neglect and poverty to make up for. We have to put in water delivery system. We have to put in paved roads. We have to put in the hospitals and schools. We're a long ways behind most other segments of American society, both in Arizona and, and nationally. Regaining water is a high priority. The Pima have been fighting for their water rights for centuries, facing opposition by non-tribal economic interests and skepticism and resistance at high political levels. It was difficult, and there was uh, underlying all this was, I believe, a lot of um, um, not racial hostility, hostility, but a, a lot of uh, feelings about tribes that we didn't deserve the water, we didn't deserve to be in these negotiations, we didn't have a good, strong, valid claim for water. By the early 1980s, new players entered the fray, citrus growers, Energy producers from several states, resort developers, all joined the scramble for liquid gold. Rod Lewis spent several decades on the Pima legal team. We have sat down with each one of those parties, spent literally thousands of hours right here in this room working on deals to settle our differences as between us. All of that effort led to the Arizona Water Rights Settlement Act of 2004. After a hundred years, water is flowing down the Gila River again. The Water Rights Act provides the Pima the water and resources needed to rebuild their farms, but it also promises something more. It is not about economic gain. It is about rebuilding our community. It has never been about personal gain. It is about the return of our culture. I truly believe the warm, gentle winds of heaven are once again blowing. On the Akhmet Autumn and the Peeposh, God bless you all. God bless the Gila River. This is Durham wheat. Okay. Uh, we contract Durham wheat this year with Arizona grain. Desert Durham wheat is what we grow here. Basically, it's for the pasta uh, manufacturers. A lot of it grows to, goes to Italy for, for the making of pasta. Most of the time, we get a better contract for that than other varieties. The allotment that you're in is in section 12. Okay. And this is Gilbert Road right The tribe and some individual members are now planning to expand their farming. It's been nearly 20 years since Tony Antone cultivated his own allotment. So does that kind of make it clearer? Yeah, a lot. A lot. A lot better than yeah, how, I, you know, just trying to explain mm -hmm. it on the phone. And, yeah. And that way I won't 
argue with you next time. <laughs> <laughs> In truth, we have more control over the, the problems like diabetes than we realize. We can't think of diabetes and colonization just simply from the role of the victim. The disease patterns like diabetes occur over many years, so we're not going to see a dramatic change overnight. But I think in the long run, as we see more success in economic and workforce development, we're going to see improvements in healthcare systems, education systems, and in social policy. We have to take more control over our own community. Things like diabetes get our attention. But by focusing on diabetes, you miss the underlying phenomena, and that's really the importance. I actually like taking pictures of the graveyard. If we took everyone at risk of disease and cured them so that they were no longer at risk, it would do virtually nothing to solve our problem because new people would continue to enter the at-risk population at an unaffected rate forever. This is my aunt. She died of complications of diabetes. The issue is we're not paying enough attention to prevention. Overwhelmingly, funds are spent on fixing people who are already sick. We have to change that formula. And here's my grandpa. He died of diabetes. He was a Madison man. He was a cowboy. He was in the Navy. I don't want to die of this, you know. I don't want to die either with one leg or two legs missing. I still see hope. I don't have to die of diabetes. You know, I'll, I'll die of some natural cause or something. Major funding for unnatural causes has been made possible by the Ford Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the California Endowment, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, and Kaiser Permanente. Additional funding provided by these funders.
This program was also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.